News headlines frequently report economic conditions, but many citizens find the information confusing. This chapter introduces the basic language of macroeconomics and national income accounting, focusing on gross domestic product and how it is calculated from the expenditure and income approaches. For the sake of this class, we focus on the expenditure approach the most. The importance of investment is given considerable emphasis, including the nature of investment and the distinction between gross and net investment, the role of inventory changes, and the impact of net investment on economic growth. The chapter then defines and discusses other measures of economic activity and concludes by examining the shortcomings of current GDP measurement techniques. National income accounting does for the economy what private accounting would do for an individual household or business. The Bureau of Economic Analysis, an agency of the Department of Commerce, compiles the data and reports it in national income and product accounts. This information is used by economists and policymakers in formulating decisions for the best interest of the nation. The primary measure of the economy's performance as a whole is its aggregate output. This is most commonly calculated as gross domestic product, or as we'll refer to it, GDP. GDP is a monetary measure in that everything is valued in dollars. All goods and services produced must be converted into dollar values for GDP to work. To avoid multiple counting of goods, GDP includes only the market value of final goods and ignores intermediate goods, which are goods either purchased for resale or for further processing into those final goods. GDP could also avoid multiple counting by counting only the value added at each stage. Value added is the market value of a firm's output less the value of the inputs that the firm purchased from others. If you look at 24.1, the table in your book, money valuation allows the summing of apples and oranges. Money acts as the common denominator. GDP is designed to measure what is produced during the current time period. Existing products that are sold or transferred including used items, are not counted since they've already been counted in previous years. Also, purely financial transactions are excluded because nothing new is created. Assets are just simply being transferred to new owners. Some examples of different transfer payments, Social Security, Welfare, or Veterans Benefits, those are public transfer payments. Um, also, allowances or cash gifts, those would be private transfer payments. The sale of stocks and bonds, not including the broker's fee, are counted in GDP for services rendered, but the sale of stocks and bonds would be, not be counted in GDP since you are repurchasing something that's already been sold. Secondhand sales are also excluded because they do not represent current output. Here's an example of the value added model in a five stage production process. The value added is calculated as the difference between the sales value of the materials and the value of the good at the previous production stage value. Using this method, method is another way of avoiding multiple counting. GDP can be viewed from two different perspectives. The income approach looks at GDP in terms of the income derived or created from producing goods and services. The expenditures approach measures GDP as the sum of all the money spent in buying the output. In theory, either method should yield equal results. The expenditures and income approaches are two different ways of looking at the same thing. You could look at a quarter from the head side or from the tail side, but it's still worth the same amount. This is the same as the expenditures and income approach for calculating GDP. This is also expressed in the circular flow of income that we looked at in earlier chapters, where the producers would purchase resources from the households, and the households would use that income to purchase goods and services from the firms. Here are the two different approaches to measuring GDP. On the left, the expenditures approach measures GDP as the sum of four items. First one, consumption of households. Second one, investment by businesses. The third is government purchases. And the fourth is expenditures by foreigners, or as we call it, net exports. On the right, the income approach uses different inputs. First is wages, then rents, then interest, profits, and statistical adjustments. But each of these items will be further discussed, but they both equal the same number, which gives us GDP. For now, let's focus on the expenditure side. 
Personal consumption expenditures, indicated by a C notation, covers all expenditures by households on goods and services during a year. In any given year, approximately 10% of these expenditures are for durable consumer goods, which are defined as having a life of three years or more. Another 30% go to non-durable goods such as food, clothing, and gasoline, and the other 60% are for services leading to the U.S. economy, frequently being referred to as a service economy. Anywhere from two-thirds to three-fourths of GDP can be accounted for just by looking at the consumer section. The second component of the expenditures approach is gross private investment, which includes all final purchases of machinery, equipment, and tools by businesses, all construction, and changes in inventories. Do not confuse the word investment with financial investment. We are talking about the investment in capital and inventory. Remember in chapter 23, we discussed inventories. If total output exceeds current sales, inventories build up. If businesses are able to sell more than they currently produce, this entry will be a negative number to account for the fact that those goods were produced in earlier years and now being sold. There are also non-investment transactions. Investment does not include ownership transfers of paper assets like stocks and bonds or real assets like houses, jewelry, or art. Only newly created capital is counted as investment. We also need to account for what is called net private domestic investment. So the first part was the gross private domestic investment. But one thing that needs to be accounted for is depreciation. Depreciation is the amount of capital, like plant, plants or equipment, used up over a year as it deteriorates and wears out. Net investment equals gross investment minus depreciation. If more new structures and capital equipment are produced in a year than are used up, net investment is positive and the productive capacity of the economy will expand. And you can see this in figure 24.2 in your book. When gross investment and depreciation are equal, a nation's productive capacity is static. When gross investment is less than depreciation, net investment is negative and the economy's productive capacity declines. The last two components of the expenditures approach are government purchases and net exports. Government purchases are officially labeled government consumption expenditures and gross investment. It includes expenditures for goods and services that the government uses in providing public services and expenditures for publicly owned capital, such as for schools and roads. It excludes government transfer payments, such as Social Security, because it's merely transferring government receipts to certain households and does not generate any sort of production. Net exports are calculated by subtracting the value of imported goods from the value of exported goods. Adding up all four components provides a measure of GDP, a measure of the market value of a specific year's total output. In the United States in 2009, GDP was $14,256,000,000,000. That number is nearly triple the GDP of Japan and China. And you can see this in your book in the Global Perspective 24.1. This chart calculates GDP for 2009 in the United States by using both the expenditures approach and the income approach. Note that both methods come to the same conclusion for the year, just the income approach adds a few extra details that makes it a little more cloudy and confusing. So let's briefly look at the income approach. This approach allocates expenditures as income to those responsible for producing the output, the workers. The major component is national income, which is made up of employee consumption, rents, interests, proprietor's income, corporate profits, and taxes on production and imports. The largest share is employee compensation, which includes wages and salaries paid by both businesses and government, as well as supplements such as benefits paid by employers on behalf of employees. And this makes sense, because when they are paid their income, they turn around and become consumers, which represents the largest sum in the expenditures approach. Under the income approach, all expenditures on final goods and services flow as income to either private citizens or the government. To move from national income to GDP, several adjustments must be made. The first adjustment is for net foreign factor income. This is income Americans gain from supplying resources abroad, which would be taken out, and then income that foreigners gain from supplying resources to the U.S. would be added. The next adjustment comes from what is called a statistical discrepancy which basically is just a balancing amount. The final adjustment factor is the useful life of private capital equipment that extends well beyond the year in which they were produced. 
The cost of the equipment must be allocated over its useful life. The other national accounts provide useful information about the economy's performance. Net domestic product is gross domestic product, less consumption of fixed capital. National income is net domestic product, less the statistical discrepancy, and plus the net foreign factor income. Personal income includes all income received, regardless of whether it is earned or unearned. And finally, disposable income is personal income, less personal taxes. So let's put that into everyday language and rewind to the income, the beginning of the income approach. First of all, wages. That's the compensation of employees. Second is rents. That's payments for supply and property resources. The fourth is interest. That's money paid by private businesses to the suppliers of loans used to purchase capital. The fifth is proprietor's income. That's income of unincorporated businesses like sole proprietorships, partnerships, and cooperatives. The sixth is corporate profits. Those are earnings of corporations. Corporations act almost as if they are a person in themselves. After corporate income taxes are paid to government, dividends are distributed to the shareholders and the remainder is left as retained earnings, which can be used later to invest in new plants and equipment. But we'll get to that more later in the stock market section. Number seven is taxes on production and imports, general sales tax, excise taxes, business property taxes, license fees, and customs duties. And the sum of all those entries equals our national income. All income earned by American supplied resources, whether here or abroad, plus taxes on productions and imports. You can see this in figure 24.1 in your book and table 24.3 in your book. At this point, we make the adjustments on the net foreign factor income and that statistical discrepancy. The statistical discrepancy, by the way, is decided by NIPA accountants. They add a statistical discrepancy to the national income to equalize the income and the expenditure approaches. So they use the expenditure approach to find the more accurate number as it is. The other four are just simply other national accounts that we'll get to later on um, in more detail. This table illustrates the relationship between GDP, net domestic product, national income, personal income, and disposable income. This was for 2009. Now that we've added all of this to our economy, here is our updated circular flow. Now before you panic, I don't expect you to memorize this, and this isn't anything that you would ever draw out. It looks extremely complicated, but if you were ever lost along the step and you wanted to figure out how did we get that number in GDP, this kind of lays it all out for you. We can see that even when we account for more transactions in the economy, income and expenditures are still going to be equal. Now, GDP measures production at current dollar values, which creates problems because the value of the dollar changes over time. A hundred years ago, the purchasing power of one dollar was much different than it is today. To get around that problem, there's two different types of GDPs. Nominal GDP is based upon the prices that were in effect when the output was produced. A GDP that has been deflated or inflated to reflect changes in the price levels is referred to as real GDP. In order to calculate real GDP, a base year must be selected and then the current year's prices adjusted accordingly. So let's do some practice with that. Now just flat GDP would be P times Q, price times the quantity. How much did we sell everything for? How much did we make? But in order to adjust it according to the price index, we're going to have to add some extra steps. Valid comparisons of real output over time cannot be made with nominal GDP alone because both price and quantities are subject to change. To make such comparisons, a dollar must keep the same purchasing power. So the adjustment process in a one product economy we'll use table 24.5 in your book. One method is to calculate price index and divide the nominal GDP by the price index. This is the formula used to calculate real GDP. We use a price index that is equal to the price of a collection of goods and services in the specific year divided by the price for the same goods and services in a base year multiplied by 100. Nominal GDP is then divided by the price index in hundredths to determine real GDP. Price index is a measure of the price of a specific collection of goods and services, which they also call the market basket in a given year, compared to the price of the identical market basket in the base year. An alternative method is to gather separate data 
on the quantity of physical output and determine what it would sell for in the base year, and the result is the real GDP. The price index is implied in the ratio, nominal GDP divided by real GDP, multiplied by 100 to put it in the standard index. In this table, nominal GDP and real GDP are calculated based upon the formula. Years 1 to 3 have been calculated. Complete the table for years 4 and 5, and let's see what you come up with. If you come into class on Monday with years 4 and 5 completed, I'll give you 10 bonus points on your test. The actual GDP price index is called the Chain Type Annual Wage Price Index and is more complex. Once nominal GDP and the GDP price index are established, the relationship between them and real GDP is clear. And you can see that in table 24.7 in your book. The base year price index is always 100 because nominal GDP and real GDP use the same prices. Because the long-term trend has been for prices to rise, adjusting nominal GDP to real GDP involves inflating the lower prices before the base year and deflating the higher prices after the base year. Real GDP values allow more direct comparison of physical output from one year to the next because a constant dollar measure has been used. While GDP is a reasonably accurate and highly useful measure of how the economy is performing, it does have several shortcomings, and you're as much responsible for knowing those as knowing GDP. Certain productive activities occur outside of any market and therefore are not measured in the traditional way. The value of leisure time, weekends, holidays, it also is not included, but they certainly add value due to the added satisfaction they provide to workers. GDP fails to capture the value, full value of improvements in product quality. Let's face it, a 42-inch plasma screen flat panel television is a vast improvement over the old black and white vacuum tube models. There's also a huge underground economy, mainly comprised of illegal activities, that produces income that is not measured through traditional GDP methods. Included in this underground economy, economy are legal activities that provide income that the recipients do not wish to report to the IRS and pay taxes on. Yes, I said legal activities. If you go and mow your neighbor's lawn for $20, you don't report that to the IRS nine times out of 10. That is a legal underground economy. Environmental issues and non-economic sources of well-being are also problematic and that GDP does not really have a way to accurately value and report the issues. Sometimes the cheapest way of producing something and maximizing your production may destroy the environment around you. This table shows the underground economy as a percentage of GDP in several nations. Three factors that help explain the variation size are the extent and complexity of regulation, the type and degree of taxation, and the effectiveness of law enforcement in the subject nation. Notice the United States, although fairly high on the world scale, is very low on these developed nations. Also remember, GDP simply adds the dollar value of what is produced. Whether the products are good or detrimental to society, it makes no difference if the product is a semi-automatic rifle or a jar of baby food. Per capita GDP may give some hint as to the relative standard of living in the economy, but GDP figures do not provide information about how that income is distributed. So a country with very high GDP may have a very large population of lower class individuals living in sub-poverty. A great example being China. So where do we get all of this information? Well, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, an agency of the Department of Commerce, is responsible for compiling the NIPA tables. The BEA gets its data from a variety of sources. The consumption data comes from four primary sources, three of which are provided by the Census Bureau. The Retail Trade Survey gathers sales data from a sample of 22,000 firms. The Survey of Manufacturers collects information on shipments of consumer goods from 50,000 establishments. And the Service Survey collects sales data from 30,000 service businesses. The BEA also collects information from a variety of industry trade sources. For investment data, the BEA looks at the consumption sources as well as the Housing Starts Survey and Housing Sales Survey produced by the Census Bureau. The data for government purchases comes from the Office of Personal Management, OPM, which collects data on wages and benefits of both public and private sectors, and the Construction Survey and the Census Bureau Survey of Government Finance, which provides data on government consumption and investment expenditures. The net exports data comes from U.S. Customs Service reports 
and the BEA surveys of domestic exporters and importers of service. You do not need to memorize all of this information. As you read through the chapter, make sure you read the last word, the Magical Mystery Tour, 